fruit versus dried fruit. Oh my God. I think this is one of my favorite topics. Okay. Let's okay. go. So you know how people say, um, well, it's fruit, so it's natural. Yeah. Okay. So I have a scoop for you. The fruit that we have today in our supermarkets is not natural. Just like humans bred gray wolves into chihuahuas for their entertainment, humans have been crossing and breeding fruit for millennia to make them more appetizing for humans, to make mm -hmm. them sweeter, to make them have fewer seeds, less fiber. If you look at an ancestral banana, it's tiny, it's full of seeds, it's quite dense and it's not very sweet. If you look at a banana today, it's very sweet. Very little fiber, very little seeds, super easy to eat. Humans have been creating these fruits mm. to be extra juicy and extra sweet and extra full of sugar. So that's one thing to note. The fruit you see today in the supermarket is not natural. However, a piece of fruit still has fiber in it. And fiber is protective, as I explained at the beginning. Fiber helps reduce the glucose spike of a meal mm -hmm. because it creates that mesh in the intestine. So if you want to eat something sweet, eating fiber is still the best, sorry, eating a piece of whole fruit is still the best thing to do because of that fiber blunting the spike mm. from the sugar. The problem arises when we denature that piece of fruit. So maybe we're going to juice an apple. Mm. As a result, we're removing all the fiber from the apple and we're concentrating the sugar that was already being concentrated for centuries by humans in that whole apple. When we dry fruit, we take away all of the water. So we concentrate the sugar and we eat way more pieces of dried fruit than we would of regular fruit. Yeah. And what's I think particularly concerning about that is there's quite a few companies now which are targeting children with dried fruit. And I think many parents are, again, I'm, I, I, I always say this and I want to reiterate this point. I genuinely believe that all parents are doing the best that they can in the context of their life situation, the context of their knowledge. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure that those dried fruit packets are the best thing to be giving our kids, particularly on an empty stomach. Yes, although you could argue that dried fruit is better than like candy because at least it has some fiber in it. But what would be even better if you really want to give dried fruit would be to pair it with some nuts, for example. Yeah. So you make a little snack with like a few like dried apricots and then some pecans or whatever. That's better because you're putting some clothes on the, on the yeah. carbs, right? I get it. And then that's what I love about all your suggestions. They can be applied by anyone in any situation, no matter what diet they're following. Yes. Little hacks, little tweaks, just to make things a little bit better than they would have otherwise been, right? Exactly. We're not talking like big overhaul yeah. of your life, of your food habits. No, no, no. Small tweaks, big impact. Yeah. Adding those nuts into the dried fruit, yeah. you can see how it could be really tasty. Yeah, absolutely. And change the blood sugar response. Absolutely. Now, just, I had a thought there, Jesse. A lot of the time, the cultural wisdom that's there, we're now learning the modern science again. That's why that works. Now, the only place where I think your recommendations don't match up with certainly the ancient wisdom that I'm aware of is with fruit on empty stomachs. Mm. Because I know in Ayurvedic medicine, for many years, they have been talking about if you're having a piece of fruit, have it before your meal, yeah. because then it's digested uh, really easily, and it yeah. doesn't then sort of fester on top of your meal afterwards. Now, first of all, uh, I'd welcome your thoughts on that. But just a, a little ad addition there, based on what you just said about the fact that the way fruit is bred now compared to how fruit is bred in the past, maybe two or 3,000 years ago, maybe. the fruit that we were getting, lower in sugar, not quite as sweet, Maybe that worked then. Maybe it doesn't work so well now. I don't know. But what, what's your sort of perspective on that? Well, this is a very common question. Is and it? I was fascinated by it. I was like, okay, where does this come from? Like, why do we think that fruit rots in the stomach if it's eaten last? And through my research, I found that there was a doctor in the Renaissance who said that fruit, and this is a separate branch from the Ayurveda stuff, but this doctor said that if you eat fruit after a meal, it's going to rot and putrefy in your stomach and create all these vapors and stuff. Um, that doctor just said that. I mean, I don't know where he pulled that out of, but it just is not true. Like nothing actually rots or mm. putrefies in the stomach. So that particular thing about the rotting is just not true. Nothing can rot in the stomach, actually. Mm. So 
There is this ancient wisdom about having the fruits on an empty stomach or at the beginning of a meal. And to that I say, well, we have two opposing views, right? We have the glucose science, which says if you want to eat something sweet, the best time for your glucose is at the end of a meal. And we have ancient wisdom that could also, you know, have some really good sources. So maybe where we land is if you don't feel any discomfort by mm -hmm. eating fruit after a meal, maybe you do that. And if you're somebody and your body's like, no, it's not working, maybe it gives you bloating or whatever, then you switch it up, you know. It's up to you to sort of tailor these recommendations to other things going on in your life. So what you're recommending is we take a pragmatic, nuanced approach to our health. <laughs> Mind-blowing. You know, it's 2023. That's not the way it goes. Yeah, I know. I know. And I think this is also why, um, you know, my work has been so well received is that it feels fresh and nice and it's no longer an yeah. extreme diet. It's not like cut out entire food groups. It's like, okay, guys, I think we're over diets. Like personally, I would rather we never, ever have any diets ever again. So what about we use all this recent science and we find these principles that are easy, that have a big impact on our physical and our mental health, that are not very hard, don't cost any money. Yeah. And uh, how about we do that? And people seem to, to be quite people happy with like that, that approach. <laughs> now, Jesse, it's almost impossible now to have the audience size which you have and not get pushback. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sure it's technically possible, but I would say it's almost impossible. Yeah. If and when people push back against your work, what is the common thing they say and how do you respond? Mm. So I've, I've experienced like multiple waves of this. Okay. Um, and I sort of categorize pushback or criticism in two camps. So there's like the stuff that really I can't do anything about. For example, um, people who don't want to hear any information about food <laughs> because it's no, but you know, because maybe they had an eating disorder in the past. Yeah. Maybe they're just like, no. So for those people, my work is like, they just, they just hate it because I'm talking about food. Those things I don't really pay attention to because, you know. It's not for them. Exactly. And then you have the useful criticism. And from the beginning of the Glucose Goddess project, I've always really listened to feedback, whether it's in comments or in DMs or in real life. Like, because my purpose here is to make science accessible, to make it inclusive, to make sure that I'm serving the people that I want to give this information to. Mm. So I would say the biggest criticisms have been from people with type 1 diabetes, maybe this was a year ago that it started happening, that they didn't like that I was using a glucose monitor as a, not, as a person without diabetes. And I really listened very carefully to this because um, a lot of people were sharing with me how um, saddened it made them that I was like showing my glucose monitor, like, hey, I'm wearing a glucose monitor. And for them, it was a device that they need to survive. And so I really took that to heart and I started thinking a lot about my glucose monitor approach and, you know, whether I think it's for everybody. I stopped also posting photos of myself with the device being mm. like, hey, glucose monitor. Now I really am just like, I'm using it to make the illustrative graphs, but I no longer um, use it as like a fashion statement. Yeah. You know, so that was really, really helpful. I think another thing that people uh, push back on is the close on carbs thing. They say, yes, but if you take it to an extreme it could be harmful. Like, as I explained at the beginning, you could put two pounds of butter on a piece of bread mm. and that would reduce the spike, but you need to have more nuance. And that I think I really address it in the book quite well. So... I think you do address it really yeah. well. I think, you know, I've read both books and I think you're really clear that it's not to stress you out, right? This is not mm -hmm. necessarily to be applied in every situation. Yeah. This is to try and help you, yeah. right? Yeah, sure. In an ideal world, we'd all eat an exclusively whole food diet mm -hmm. that was naturally stabilizing our blood sugars. But the reality is most people, or at least many people, are going to struggle with that. Yes. And I think, particularly in this second book, this new book, the testimonials, I just love reading them. You know, you mentioned eating disorders. There Let's is a testimonial, that. right? Yeah. There's a testimonial. I, I can't remember which book it's in about bulimia yeah. and how uh, a young lady, I think, with bulimia mm -hmm. said, your method has really helped them. And before you answer, I have quite a lot of thoughts on what you just said. And, you know, I've been trying to communicate health messaging to the public since maybe 2014 now through TV shows, books, podcasts, whatever it might be, right? Yeah. And... You simply cannot anymore communicate health information and not get pushback. 
And the reality is not all information is for everyone. Mm -hmm. I try, I think like you do, to be as compassionate as possible when putting out that information. And now I can be relatively detached when, if and when pushback comes and and, and go, yeah, I can actually learn from that. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Or I actually disagree with that. Or I can see that that person is being really, really triggered by something. This ain't about me. This is about them, right? So I think taking a compassionate approach to that has been really helpful. Mm. I understand what you're saying about the type 1 diabetics, and I can understand why um, certain members of that community may feel like that. But technology and progress is going to come in every form. CGMs are here. They're here to stay. They're only going to get more and more popular. I do believe they can be a valuable tool for some people with the right education, with the right context. I think they can be an incredible tool for the right person. Yeah. And to be fair, there's a whole other part of the community of people with type 1 diabetes who are super happy that I'm wearing one because it destigmatizes it for them. There you go. So there's always, you know, pros and cons. And on the eating disorders front, um, I really got very interested in this topic and I spoke to many experts on the subject because I got a few comments being like, oh, these rules are just an eating disorder waiting to happen. And I thought that was really unfortunate that, you know, we need to nuance something that's a diet and that's really unhealthy, unscientific, completely random and could cause some difficult behaviors, but also with advice that people need because people are dying. Like, (laughs) so, and that was a tough one for me to get through. I was like, okay, how, like, where do I land? Like what's true about not wanting to encourage disordered eating and what's true about wanting to give these very important pieces of information that are life-changing and potentially life-saving. So, but it's an ongoing journey, you know, the pushback. I try to learn from every thing that happens. Yeah. You you get this. Um, I've I've definitely had it when we've done podcasts on fasting before. Mm. And I've thought long and hard about this. Is this irresponsible? Should I be doing it? And where I've landed is, you know, I try and caveat it. I try and make sure in the introductions to each podcast, we say this may not be suitable for people who are recovering from or suffering with eating disorders. Having said that, some people with eating disorders find fasting incredibly useful. I know that because people are fed back. And also, let's just look at what's going on around us. You know, in America, what is it? 88 or 90% of people may be metabolically unhealthy. Mm -hmm right? Stabilizing their blood sugar is going to save their life. Yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. But, so, and I think we all, and I know it's hard because I know sometimes it's parents of kids who are struggling. They've got like a 12-year-old or a 14-year-old who's really struggling with an eating disorder. And then they get often, and I can totally understand it, feel very defensive and upset when they see certain posts but I'm not sure I have the solution to it apart from trying to approach these things with compassion. Yes. I don't know because not everything is for everyone. Absolutely. And then, you know, you also have to remember that of the people reading your books, like listening to your podcast, reading your content, like 99% of people are so thrilled and happy. Yeah. And then there are a few people who are triggered or upset that will comment and that's what we see, right? Yeah. But it's really it's really not representative of the reality. That being said, I think, you know, I'm on in the same boat as you, which is I try to learn and be as respectful and mindful as possible. And um then once you feel like you've done the right thing, if somebody still doesn't like it, well, you know, so be it. Jesse, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. It really has. I mean We've not even scratched the surface over what's in your two books. Uh, And I can see why so many people follow you online. So many people have been moved by your work. It's making a real material difference in their lives and therefore the lives of the people around them, Mm -hmm. right? That's something I'm so passionate about. You can change one person. You don't just change them. They've got more energy. They're less moody, they're less cranky. That impacts how they parent, that impacts how they are with their partners, how they are with their work colleagues, right? So I think the work you're doing is so, so important. This podcast is called Feel Better, Live More. When we feel better in ourselves, we get more out of our lives. Mm -hmm. I think you would probably add when we have stable blood sugars (laughs) levels, we get more out of our lives. Absolutely. For people who feeling inspired by what Mm. they've heard and want to start making changes right now. Do you have any final words of wisdom for them? 
I would say get the glucose goddess method, my new book. It's going to be your partner in helping turn these hacks into lifelong habits. And if you can't afford it or you don't want to buy a book, just go on my Instagram and start looking at the graphs that I share. Savory breakfast, veggies first, vinegar, movement, close on carbs, and there's many more things you'll discover. But those can become your best friends in your daily life. And for someone who's saying, Jesse, hear you, I hear what you're saying, but I cannot see how my mood or my mental health has got mm. anything to do with my blood sugar levels. What would you say to them? I would say, look at the studies. It really, really does. Or just try the 10 minute calf push up at your desk after your next meal and see if your mood doesn't improve. See it for yourself. I would say test it and, um, you know, your body will speak for itself. If you enjoyed that short clip, I think you are really going to enjoy the full conversation, which you can check out here.